Hey everyone, welcome back for more part two during week number 10. Here we're going to look at how DNA replicates. So you should be able to draw and describe how DNA replication occurs with regard to what we call the lagging and leading strands. Tell me where mutations are introduced and how can we fix those. Uber basics. Since we know that DNA is paired A with T, C with G, if I know one side, I can automatically tell you what the other side is, which is pretty straightforward. The direction turns out to be important. It turns out that the two ends of DNA don't replicate the same, which is going to cause some trouble later. And DNA replicates 5' prime to 3', prime, meaning we constantly are adding on to the 3' prime end. In a sense, it's kind of like how in English we can't just start writing letters however we want. They actually have a pattern that you must follow. So you start on the left and add letters to the right, which is true for, again, writing in English. So that's the pattern that we're going to follow. That's what the 5 prime, 3 prime end is. Like, there is a side that you have to add on to, and the other side you don't add on to. So, if I had this sequence here, so as you can see it, if I were to write this in the way it replicates, it's going to seem rather strange. So the sides pair up. So 3 prime ends pairs with the 5 prime. I always start on the 5 prime end, and I would just write C, T, G, T, A, C, T, G, T, G, A, C, G. Which looks weird the way I wrote it, but if I were to write this, again, in the way that it actually is written, it would move that way. Is that a weird bit? Yeah, it causes some difficulty when DNA replicates, so if we wanted to read any type of DNA sequence, we have to keep this in mind because we might be reading things backwards. DNA is going to get replicated before cell division, in particular it's during S phase of, of interphase, and this DNA replication is going to be the source of our sister chromatids, meaning when we went from... oops our single line to our double line. This is purely going to be due to DNA replication. There are several enzymes that play a role in DNA replication, and I wish to point out a few of them. Not because there is fundamental knowledge that's to be gained by knowing the names of these things. It's that there's actual patterns in biology, and it's not all just memorization even though it still feels like that. So helicase, ACE, it's an enzyme, and it's going to act on the helix, or the double helix. So it's the one that opens up the DNA. Primase, ACE, enzyme, prime, referencing the idea of a primer. <clears throat> so DNA primer, or when we start, if you wanted to paint a room, so... We have a wall in here, and if I wanted to repaint it, I wouldn't just start taking a new paint of coat and just start painting over it. What I would need to do is kind of flush it so we have like a base coat underneath. We call that the primer coat, and then you would paint it over it. Well, that's what this turns out to be. DNA can't replicate on its own. It needs a starting point, and we call that starting point an, a primer. The primer is going to be made out of RNA. Always, always, always. The RNA during DNA or during DNA replication, primers are made out of RNA. Other enzyme we could have is again, it's an ACE. It's going to make a polymer of DNA, and that is DNA polymerase. So it's going to add the the new nucleotides. In terms of the steps, here's what we would see. We open up DNA at very specific locations, and it's going to create immediately what we call a replication fork, meaning it's going to look like this. We're going to get this split, where we're replicating 
in that direction. Once I add my primers, I have primers on both sides. What I'm going to notice is on my primers, one side is going to have a three prime end, and I can freely replicate. And we call this ultimately what we call the leading strand. So the leading strand here is a side that has a free three prime end, and it's free to replicate. The other side is going to have a five prime end, which means it actually is going to have to wait in order to let it replicate. And we call that the lagging strand. The way it's going to do that is going to look really weird. It actually follows what's known as a pulsatile motion. Well, pulsa not motion, but pulsatile replication. So it's going to replicate, then stop. Then it's going to replicate, then stop. Then replicate, then stop. That turns out to be more or less all I really want you to know. When we replicate DNA, one side can replicate continuously. The other side kind of replicates in spurts. In bacteria, this isn't an issue. They just replicate, then they're done. With us eukaryotes... Oh, I thought I fixed everything. Nope. So we turn out to have things that are called telomeres. So, spelling correction right there, E-S. So telomeres turn out to be the end pieces of our chromosomes. And it turns out they shorten during DNA replication, which is problems for us. Depending on the researcher, well, we know that when telomeres get too short, the result is the cell stops replicating. We think it's enough to convince the cell that there's DNA damage. And when there's DNA damage, the cell just says, nope, we're not fixing this. And you get the cell we think it might also have something to do with aging but we're not entirely sure because it's really hard to do those experiments in terms of a picture it would look something like this although this picture which came from your textbook um, for the sake of saying it, it's wrong and the way I would point out that it is wrong is this chunk up here is actually what we would call a lagging strand And the result of that is it actually wouldn't look like this at all. So this picture actually has flaws in it. I mean, it's a free book, so what are we going to do? So this top strand here, this is what we would call the leading strand. And this bottom chunk here that's kind of broken into chunks, this here is what we call the lagging strand. And the thing about leading and lagging strands is I only apply the terms like leading and lagging when I look at a particular replication fork. So for the fork that's on the left, the top strand is leading, the bottom strand is lagging. On this one here, on the right, the bottom strand is actually the leading and the top strand is the lagging, even though the figure screwed it up. So it is worth noting that, again, Leading and lagging is a relative thing, and it's usually by the fork itself. This turns out to be what we have to do to fix these telomeres, these end pieces. We actually create, it's not really an enzyme, so it's, we call it telomerase, but it's not really an enzyme. What it turns out to be is like an extra set of primers that allow cells to add on and prevent the shortening. We see this in us, in humans, in germ cells, or specifically germline cells. So these are going to be the cells that will eventually give you sperm or egg. And that should be about it. It is very famously found, however, in cancerous cells. So saying why can't we just like unleash this enzyme into our normal cells and we won't live or we'll, we won't age, we'll be able to live much longer? That's what cancer does. And that's just no bueno. During DNA replication, because we're adding in new nucleotides, 
one of the things that we have to worry about now is the fact that we could put in the wrong nucleotides. If you put in the wrong nucleotide in the wrong cell, so if you put in the wrong nucleotide in your skin, you're not passing your skin cells on to anyone else. But if you put in the wrong nucleotide into a sperm or into an egg, that does get passed on to the next generation. And that change that can be inherited is what we call the mutation. It's the change in the DNA is the mutation. We turn out to have lots of ways to fix it. I don't want to go over all those mechanisms because honestly they're not as important. But here's the big deal. We make lots of mistakes and we correct almost all of them. But we do not correct all of our mistakes. So for all of the mutations that exist, overwhelming 99% plus are actually fixed. The way that we typically will identify whether or not there's a mistake or not, a mutation, is we find what's known as a lesion. A lesion is we get this weird bump. So there's a weird bump that exists, and that's because the bases aren't matching up. And we can detect whether or not there's a mismatch or not because DNA is so uniform in its shape. So if you have anything that's weird, you have an abnormal shape, and we can identify the abnormal shape. What we tend to see is we make about three mutations per mu round of mutation, or round of replication, meaning we replicate all of our DNA, we make a whole bunch of mistakes, we fix the mistakes, and of all those, three make it through. And since we have three billion base pairs, it's literally a one in a billion mistake, which is pretty good. What we're going to look at for our last part is we're going to examine how do we make RNA, and that's through the process of transcription.